greeting to all our viewers, and we are back in the new episode of the Live series. It has been a few months since our Year to Aid, Hearing Loss and Dementia episode, and this time, we have a new topic that we are excited to share with all of you. I am Dr. Joel Abano, the Medical Director of Manila Hearing Aid, and I will be your host for tonight's live. So welcome to Here to Aid, Episode 5, Hearing Loss, Vertigo, and Balance. Last time, we talked about the relationship between hearing loss and dementia, and how the presence of hearing loss can directly affect our brain's response. Now, the topic will revolve around the relationship between hearing loss, vertigo, and any other balance problems. Is there a connection between the two? Or are both symptoms of a more serious condition? Are all balance problems can lead to hearing loss or vice versa? And all the questions we have in mind will be answered by our notable guest speakers tonight. We personally invited two speakers, a Filipino otorhinolaryngology surgeon doctor who is currently the director of the Philippine Ear Institute and the head of the Hearing and Balance Center at VRP Medical Center. The other guest speaker is a doctor of audiology from Sydney who is the Director of Audiology, Knowledge Management, and Education from the Sonova Group, the global leader in innovative hearing care solutions. So let me introduce our first guest speaker tonight. Dr. Erasmo Llanes is an otorhinolaryngology and an neck surgery specialist and is currently the Director of the Philippine Ear Institute at the University of the Philippines National Institute of Health. He graduated from the University of the Philippines College of Medicine in 1997 and started his residency training at the Department of Otorhinolaryngology, Head and Neck Surgery at UP Philippine General Hospital from 1998 to 2003. In 2005, he had his fellowship training in otology, neuroautology, and hearing implant surgery at the Department of Otorhinolaryngology, Head and Neck Surgery, University Hospital of the University of Bern, Switzerland. Dr. Llanes is also a consultant at the Department of Otolaryngology Head and Neck Surgery of UP Philippine General Hospital and Carino Memorial Medical Center. He is also the clinical head of Hearing and Balance Center at VRP Medical Center and the immediate past head of the Philippine Society of Otolaryngology Head and Neck Surgery, Philippine Academy of Neuroautology, Otology and Related Sciences. So let's all welcome Dr. Erasmo Llanes. So good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all the viewers. And I'd like to thank you, Dr. Joel, for the kind introduction. And thank you to Manila Hearing Aid for inviting me to speak to Hear to Aid series, Hearing Loss, Vertigo, and Balance. Can I have the slide? So today I'll be talking about vertigo and balance. So I uh, received honorarium for speaking engagements from Manila Hearing Aid, and this lecture is not in any way been affected by this disclosure. So every day we move around, we, we go dancing, we go to the office, we, we engage in sports. But have you ever noticed how are you able to do that, to do that without falling uh, to the ground? Or how do we move around without uh, falling? It's usually a great balancing act for us as we go around in our activities of daily living. And imagine if you're walking on a tightrope, how are you able to balance yourself? So we have sensors within the body, and as God has probably made us, made these sensors, and the, the sensory organs have inputs based on the location of the body in terms of the environment. And these inputs are integrated to and send to the brain for the brain to process this, the inputs from the sensors. And the brain now provides motor, in, uh, motor responses to help us balance our way as we go around in the environment. So this might be a uh, 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 response of to, uh, to our uh, movement in the environment. So the first sensor would be coming from the inner ear. This includes the semicircular canals, the otoliths, the otolithic organs, and it's located inside the ear, as you can see in the figure. And the configuration is like a snail, where the, uh, the snail part is, like, is the cochlea, is the hearing organ. And as you can see, the, the semicircular canals are 
situated in different uh, directions to sense movement in different angles, as well as the autolytic organ sensing linear movements of the head and the body, whether uh, forward and backward or through gravity. As you can see in the, in the figure below, you can see a coronal section of the ear divided into the external ear, the green part, the middle ear, the red part, which is connected at the back of your nose, and the violet part, which is the inner ear comprising of the vestibular organ and the hearing organ. The uh, vestibular organ are paired, as you can see in the, uh, the um, schematic diagram, one on the right and one on the left, and they send uh, symmetric inputs to the brain. So in order to maintain balance, you have to have equal inputs coming from the sensory organs and delivered to the brain. Otherwise, if one is damaged, so you have an asymmetric input, then the brain senses that there's an asymmetry and realizes that the head might be moving or the, the, the head might be moving, but in fact, the body is not. And then it provides several um, reactions, such as, as uh, movement of the eyes, and then a feeling of uh, vertigo by the patient. So the eyes are also important to help us see the environment as we go around or as we move around, and it provides input to the brain. And our mechanoreceptors, sorry. Okay, sorry. And mechanoreceptors in the muscles, in the skin, in the joints, in the lower limbs, provide proprioception to help us realize how we stand on the ground, whether we are an even surface or uh, an even surface so that we can move around. All these inputs are sent to the brain and the brain processes it uh, so that it, the brain will realize that the, the, the situation or the, the, uh, how the head or the position of the patient uh, is situated in, res uh, in relation to the environment. And then it provides motor inputs to maintain balance and maintain a stable gaze. So as we move around, as we walk around, and of course, to maintain posture. This summarizes the process, how we maintain balance, providing sensory input from the three sensors, the vestibular part, the visual part, the proprioceptive for sensors, integration of the input by the brain, and then providing motor response by the different reflexes, the visible ocular reflex, and motor impulses to control eye movements and make postural adjust adjustments to maintain balance. Any disruption in the sensory organs, whether they are damaged, whether in the brain has been damaged or the motor sensors have been damaged, will all contribute to a problem in balance. In particular, if the damage in the semicircular canals, the main uh, sensation would be vertigo or false sense of movement, even when you are not moving around. And those, uh, and these are associated with nystagmus, with movement of the eyes, postural problems, and the vegetative effects like nausea and vomiting, because the pathways, the emetic pathways, are related, intimately related with the vestibular pathways. So let's go now to vertigo or dizziness. In the vernacular, we have several uh, terms that patients would tell us, so dipong, hilo, and ulao. But the challenge is how to dis differentiate this from the other forms of dizziness. So it may mean different things to people, like lightheadedness, swimming sensation, imbalance, disorientation, disequilibrium, or unsteadiness. The causes of uh, Vertigo and dizziness are many, and it's a challenge for the clinician to identify the disorders causing the uh, dizziness or vertigo. So majority would be coming from the peripheral vestibular system or the inner ear, around 50%, and the most common would be benign paroxysmal positional vertigo, around 50%, many years disease, vestibular neuritis, and labyrinthitis. The brain contributes around 5% of the causes, and that would be life-threatening like stroke and posterior circulation stroke, which comprises of 50% of neurologic dizziness, seizures, multiple sclerosis, and other cerebellar disorders. 
Of course, there are cases around 5 to 10% caused by cardiac problems like low, low blood pressure, syncope, or the sensation of fainting, orthostatic hypotension, and cardiac arrhythmias. Anxiety and panic disorders causes some form of dizziness, like, and also with malingering, phobia, somatization syndrome, phobic positional vertigo. Around 25% have unknown causes, and this probably include the multisensory disequilibrium experienced by the elderly and post-traumatic dizziness. Imbalance may be caused by vitamin B12 deficiency and peripheral neuropathy, bilateral vestibular loss, and disequilibrium of blindness. And again, migraine is common for causing imbalance, multiple strokes, and cerebellar degeneration. And the challenge is really how to differentiate dizziness from vertigo. Dizziness usually encompasses several sensations like lightheadedness, swimming sensation in the head, sense of disorientation or imbalance or unsteadiness, and vertigo. While vertigo is a false sensation of motion of either the self or surroundings, it can be spinning, turning, sense of rising, or tilting of self or the surroundings. It's always difficult to interview a patient who suffers from dizziness, as well as the patient is having difficulty describing their, uh, what they're feeling. And it's important to let them describe their, uh, what they feel, their symptoms in their own words, but you have to be ready to assist the patient in learning a new vocabulary. And you might probably introduce some words like spinning, lightheadedness, giddiness, swimming, and steadiness when walking. But sometimes people, you really have to uh, probe you know, what the patient is feeling. It's always best to spend a little extra time in educating the patient about the different subjective manifestations of dizziness, or you can use a dizziness questionnaire. So there are several causes, as I've mentioned previously, for of dizziness, and they may be non-vestibular and vestibular, as I've shown a while ago. But remember, vertigo is a symptom of a vestibular disorder, not a diagnosis. And it's a goal to differentiate whether vertigo is due to a peripheral cause or coming from the inner ear, a sensory organ, or central cause coming from the brain. If it's central, you might want to refer to a neurology specialist. If peripheral or coming from the inner ear, then you might refer to an ORL or ENT specialist. Majority of vertigo complaints are due to peripheral vestibular disorders like VPPV, Meniere's disease, and vestibular neuritis. And the next step would be to identify the condition causing the vertigo as each condition warrants specific treatment. So this just lists the, the other diagnoses of vertigo and they're arranged according to the duration of the episodes, presence of uh, hearing loss, of course, whether they are common or not common, and then whether they are coming from the sensory organs or peripheral or coming from the brain or central. As you can see, BPPV is one of the more common causes of uh, uh, vertigo, as well as Meniere's disease and vestibular migraine. This is a new uh, way of classifying vestibular diseases and it might help the clinicians in characterizing the different forms of uh, vertigo syndromes. So you have your time course, you have an acute vestibular syndrome, episodic, it occurs in episodes, and chronic vestibular syndrome. And then you check if there are triggers, whether they occur spontaneously or whether they have triggers like post-exposure to various uh, trauma. For example, triggers uh, triggered like movement with BPPV. And then whether they are less urgent or more urgent where you need uh, immediate attention. And of course, one of the more, uh, one of the most important thing is to recognize if there's stroke or hemorrhage because you might warrant immediate attention. So in many cases, history and physical examination can clinch the diagnosis, causing the vertigo and treatment is tailored based on the diagnosis. So vertigo that is absent at rest and brought only by lying down, turning over in bed, bending down, or arching back might be BPPV. On the other hand, when vertigo arises from the supine or sitting to the upright position, you might consider postural hypotension. Spontaneous vertigo may be uh, present in vestibular migraine, Meniere's disease, vestibular neuritis, and stroke. And migraine will have headaches, photophobia, and sensitivity to uh, sound or history of profound motion sensitivity, while stroke or brainstem infarction will have neurologic symptoms. Anxiety will have panic symptoms 
experienced by the patient. And more importantly, we have to consider because balance together with other features might be a signal for stroke and you might want to, pay, want to refer the patient immediately to the emergency room. And this includes loss of vision, facial asymmetry or facial paralysis, arm weakness, speech difficulty, and together with hearing loss, you might want to uh, refer the patient immediately to the emergency room. Laboratory tests are tailored uh, depending on the cause of the, of the uh, vertigo. So you may do hearing tests, imaging, vestibular test batteries like VNG, VHIT, and VEMP. Cardiac function and neurologic workup may also be, may also be done. And these are just the uh, other ancillary procedures that may tell us the vestibular function and helps in the diagnosis of the patient. Of course, the treatment principles include suppression of the vertiginous symptoms because that's very uncomfortable for the patient, treat specific causes of vertigo, and enhance vestibular compensation. So these are the suppressants that we use, uh, meclizine, diphenhydramine, and other stuff. This is the main treatment for positional vertigo is to do a kind of lift repositioning maneuver, which is 90 to 95 percent success rates. And other exercises that might help improve the symptoms of the patient. For Meniere's disease, another common uh, peripheral vestibular disorder, together with hearing loss, oral fullness, and tinnitus, there's a ladder type of treatment that can start with reassurance and salt reduction, diuretics medications to suppress the vertiginous episodes uh, as up together with uh, as uh, if refractory to this you might want to more go to more invasive treatment like intratympanic steroids and surgery vestibular neuritis inflammation of the nerve and it can be caused by virus or vascular occlusion and you can give vestibular suppressants and uh, this includes, uh, this is part of the acute vestibular syndrome, and you might want to differentiate it from stroke in the emergency room. Uh, vestibular migraine, you can give medications, but of course, you can refer this to the neurologist for long-term management. Again, uh, in summary, this would be the important things to remember. There are various causes of vertigo. You look at the time course, the trigger, and whether they are less urgent or more urgent. And then refer them to our rehab medicine specialists for vestibular rehabilitation to improve their gaze and postural stability and improve the quality of life. So vertigo is a form of disability, and it's important to identify the cause to be able to institute treatment and rehabilitation. So hopefully, uh, thank you very much, and hope uh, you'll be able to get some information from me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Lianas. It was a great discussion and we hope our viewers learned a lot from this. So I agree with you, Doctor. Adults experience dizziness and other balance-related conditions as one of the most common health issues. And many experience vertigo at least once in their lifetime. So again, as explained by Dr. Lianas, vertigo is not a diagnosis or a, med a medical condition, but a symptom of a variety of conditions. Vertigo is, is the sensation that the surrounding is spinning. Also, there are certain conditions wherein patients complain of hearing loss and, or even tinnitus since the inner ear houses both the hearing and the balance system. So again, there are several causes as mentioned, ranging from anatomical debris or displaced ear stones that stimulate the inner ear to conditions that happen after a viral infection such as a common cold or the flu. So treatment varies depending on the cause of the vertigo. So to our viewers, for patients who have recurrent dizziness or, or vertigo, consult with your doctor. Your doctor may determine the type of vertigo by examining your ears for any signs of infection, perform neurologic examination, such as asking you to walk in a straight line to assess your balance. You or she may also examine your eye movements while you are tracking an object from one point to another. Now, if your doctor suspects positional vertigo, which is the most common, for example, he or she may perform a clinic-based procedure such as the dick salt pike test, sometimes followed by canal repositioning maneuvers like the EPI maneuver. Also, depending on your symptoms, your doctor may also order balanced tests such as vigilance tomography to evaluate further the function of the inner ear, as well as audiometric tests to evaluate your hearing 
or imaging studies of your brain, such as an MRI scan, to rule out other causes of vertigo. So if you got questions, type them in the comments and our speakers will answer them during the question and answer session, together with the questions we receive days before our actual event. So now I will introduce our next and last guest speaker for tonight. Dr. Bettina Turnbull is currently the Director of Audiology, Knowledge Management and Education at Sonova and is an employee consultant to the Hear the World Foundation. Her role includes a specific focus on the Asia Pacific region which sees her passion for education and experience across disciplines employed in strengthening the profession of audiology. We're bringing world-class training programs for hearing, hearing care professionals to both develop and emerging markets. She's also a long-standing fellow and director of the Board of Australian College of Audiology, where she chairs the education committee. Dr. Turnbull completed her doctorate in audiology at A.T. Still University School of Health Sciences in Arizona in 2020, where she was awarded the Professional Leadership Award. She has recently joined the audiology faculty as an adjunct assistant professor in the post-professional doctorate of audiology program. So let us all welcome Dr. Bettina Turnbull from Sonova. Hello, Dr. Bettina. Hello, Dr. Joel, and thank you very much for inviting me to speak tonight. Um, and thank you also to Manila Hearing Aids, uh, to the Here to Aid staff, and all the Filipino viewers who are with us tonight. And I'm very excited um, to be here with you tonight. My discussion um, tonight will focus on balance dysfunction and its relationship to hearing loss. Uh, managing and assessing balance dysfunction um, is in the scope of practice for audiologists and it's really important to feel confident in this topic since so many people also um, present with some form of balance dysfunction. So if we could have the, um, the slides up. Thank you, let's see. There we go. So um, the most common conditions causing imbalance, dizziness and vertigo in different populations. Um, so Dr. Lianis went through some of these and um, I've got them slightly differently um, uh, into pediatric adult and elderly where they um, occur most often. So for pediatric um, populations, because kids also get dizzy, um, we have um, genetic disorders, migraine, and large vestibular aqueduct syndrome and concussion as being the main causes for dizziness in, in the younger populations. Um, for the adults, um, migraine, um, 50, uh, 17 to 25%, 17 being males and 25 being women, so up to a quarter of women will um, experience dizziness together with migraine concussion, um, motor vehicle accidents in this group um, are a big cause for um, balance dysfunction, diabetes, hypertension and vestibular neuritis making up the rest. In the more elderly population, um, benign paroxysmal positional vertigo or BPPV um, is present in 50% of patients who um, also present with hearing loss, so that's a huge group. And in this group, um, hearing loss, um, who have hearing loss, 85% um, of balance and dizziness and falls related um, conditions are also related to hearing loss according to Johns Hopkins Hospital. And in the emergency department, falls, dizziness and vertigo are the top um, complaints. So how is hearing loss um, related to balance dysfunction? So um, the cochlea and the vestibular system are very closely linked anatomically. Um, so if there's damage to one, it can often result in damage to the other. So these um, organs are really the one organ. Um, they share um, a fluid channel. So any, um, any trauma, noise, vibration, any metabolic disorders and um, any, um, uh, any toxins, so any um, pharmaceuticals, for example, that are toxic 
to the ear um, will generally be toxic to the whole system because um, the fluid channels um, are completely open between both of these systems. So um, we have things like um, chronic otitis media. So these are middle ear infections where you can get, um, if there's a chronic infection, it can actually cause a little hole into the, the um, posterior um, semicircular canal, which is runs right along the back of the middle ear space, and you get a, um, a perilymph fistula there, which is a, basically a hole. So you get a leakage of the fluid coming out, and that causes dizziness. A cholesteatoma is a, a middle ear, a benign middle ear tumor um, that can cause the same problem. Again, it's a little hole causing causing some fluid leakage then moving um, sort of beyond the cochlea or into the cochlea, we have um, acoustic trauma and barotrauma. So diving and in particular, actually, um, the um, people who are snorkeling because they tend to go down and up and down and up and down and up. And those first six feet down um, are actually an enormous pressure on the on the inner ear, um, and so barotrauma is is um, a, a high incidence of barotrauma in, in snorkelers actually um, compared to divers who are taught how to equalize and, and manage um, their ears um, quite well when they're diving. Aging, obviously, um, also. Then we have Meniere's disease, which um, is um, an, a, an abundance of fluid in the middle ear. Um, which um, affects both balance and hearing, and then um, endolymphatic hydrops, which is again, it's a it's a fluid, but um, not quite in the same symptomatic um, triad that many S diseases. And then beyond the cochlea, we have um, acoustic neuroma or schwannoma, which is a uh, a tumor on the acoustic nerve that can cause um, both balance and um, and hearing dysfunction. So um, is hearing loss always present in any type of balance dysfunction? So here um, I've split up into otologic and non-otologic, so ear-related and non-ear-related um, um, pathologies. Um, so again, BPPV, um, vestibular neuritis and labyrinthitis are very much focused um, in the peripheral vestibular organ. Um, and they tend not to affect hearing too much. Many years disease will always have hearing loss associated with it. It's one of the symptoms that, um, that is required for a diagnosis of many years disease. Um, vestibular schwannoma is um, like an acoustic neuroma. It's a, it's a tumor that grows on the vestibular branch of the acoustic nerve. And there it can, affect hearing depending on the um, how much it's impeding on the vascular system and whether it's um, moving over onto onto the acoustic portion of that nerve. Um, superior canal um, dehiscence is a, is a thinning of the bony structure of, of the vestibular system. Um, it can present as a mild conductive hearing loss um, but is less considered as a hearing problem as such because most people wouldn't notice it as a hearing loss. Um, Perilymphistula and barotrauma um, can have hearing loss but may not always have. Um, I've seen perilymphistula not present with hearing loss um, until you get into the higher frequencies so you actually need um, more more specific equipment to test the higher frequencies sometimes. Um, Similarly, with um, toxicity and autoimmune inner disease, ear disease, they can definitely cause hearing loss, but not always. In the um, non-ear related um, pathologies, migraine concussion, um, maldebarkment syndrome, which is sort of that feeling of, of um, coming off a boat type of thing, um, multiple sclerosis tend not to have hearing loss. Diabetes can definitely be um, have hearing loss because of the small capillaries that get damaged um, that feed the uh, that the, the cochlea, the inner ear. 
um, cardiovascular, similar, um, and similarly, and then also pharmacologic, so uh, uh, ototoxic drugs. So some antibiotics, um, for example, can can be um, toxic to the inner ear and can cause both hearing loss and balance disorder. The role of an audiologist um, when someone is diagnosed with balance dysfunction. So um, the scope of practice for an audiologist includes um, assessment of balance function, although not all audiologists um, specialize in this. They are um, definitely required to ask about balance function and have an understanding of how balance um, function and hearing function um, combine and some of the main pathologies that we've talked about and, and how they present. Um, the differential diagnosis of some of conditions such as BPPV, for example, um, certainly in the referral for medical assessment and imaging, um, vestibular re rehabilitation therapy is also in the scope of an audiologist, although this tends to be more of a specialty. Uh, this can also often be performed by physiotherapists who have special VRT training. Um, fitting of amplification where it's appropriate and where hearing loss is present, of course, certainly in the counselling around hearing loss and um, managing balance disorders, um, referral um, to support services, and the audiologist plays an integral part in the healthcare team that will be treating balance dysfunction. So when you have a patient with balance dysfunction, they would work together with the with the um, the general practitioner, the um, e, the the ENT surgeon, um, and um, any physiotherapist or other um, medical practitioner who is looking after the patient. Um, the the audiologist who is focusing mainly on rehabilitation, so mostly on um, assessment and um, fitting hearing aids for hearing loss, would still be expected to be able to ask the right questions. Um, so the medical history is a really important tool that the audiologist uses to determine whether there is any um, balance dysfunction and to try and um, gather information around what type of balance um, dysfunction might be present, especially when it comes to BPPV and Meniere's disease, which would be probably the two most commonly presented um, balance dysfunctions in, in um, any hearing clinic. And here it's important to ask about the, um, the length of time um, that, that somebody is feeling dizzy and, and the nature of the dizziness. So these would both present as rotatory vertigo type of um, uh, symptoms for the most part, not always, but for the most part. Um, and where the BPPV would be certainly less than one minute um, and the Meniere's disease uh, would be um, many minutes and, and hours even um, where people were feeling very unwell and, and really not able to move around much. So being able to tell the difference there is, is definitely um, part of, of um, the audiologist there. So do we always do hearing tests if vertigo or dizziness are present? So for this question, um, it really comes down to the symptoms that are reported in most audiology clinics, people would present for hearing loss rather than for balance alone, depending on what clinic you're working in. So um, if you're working in um, a more of a diagnostic clinic or you're working together um, with an ENT doctor in a, in a more of a hospital setting or in an ENT um, surgery, then you might have people coming along just with dizziness symptoms, but um, a hearing test would always be indicated if there is a report of hearing loss or um, there is a um, report of imbalance, so more of that sort of, um, not quite that vertigo, which is very much a rotatory type of sensation. Um, reports of fullness in the ear, 
um, fluctuating hearing loss, um, a, a rotatory vitigo, um, history of or active middle ear disease, um, a history of prolonged antibiotic chemotherapy or other ototoxic med um, medication therapy, history of barotrauma, history of head injury, stroke, or some kind of um, like in a motor vehicle accident, sort of a whiplash type of injury, um, and any sudden onset um, symptoms. Can hearing aids help manage balance dysfunction? The, um, the, the, the answer to that is essentially no. Um, hearing aids cannot manage vertigo or dizziness. However, studies have shown that wearing hearing aids can help stabilize imbalance and reduce the risk of falls. Um, a study in 2015 by Romella and um, his uh, colleagues showed that wearing hearing aids will provide a significant improvement in balance um, and a decreased risk of falling amongst older adults with hearing loss. Um, this suggests that hearing aids offer um, a new type of treatment modality for imbalance and allow auditory inputs to be considered along with vestibular, proprioceptive and visual cues um, as important contributors to maintaining balance. Um, and since so many of our patients have hearing loss um, and 85% of um, falls um, that turn up in the ED also have hearing loss, um, this is actually quite an important study. It's only a small one and we do need more. So we have to take this with, um, you know, carefully. However, um, there was a significant um, um, uh, benefit shown to um, wearing hearing aids and what they had was a, um, a like a foam mat and they had people standing on a foam mat um, first without hearing aids and, th and, and then with hearing aids with um, and, and both times um, sounds were presented and um, in, in two different conditions there was a significant improvement um, in people um, in people's stability. So um, this is something that Sonova certainly is um, is investigating further as, um, over time. So what um, hearing interventions are recommended for patients with balance dysfunction? So for elderly patients with hearing loss and imbalance or increased risk of falls and other balance dysfunction where he hearing loss is also present, any suitable and appropriate bilateral amplification um, would be suitable. For many years disease, um, we do specifically look for wide dynamic range compression, which helps to um, mitigate um, a strong recruitment, with, um, which is often present for many um, people who suffer from many years disease. So there's the inability to cope well with a um, changing loudness of sounds. Um, multiple programs are also recommended so that they can cater to good or bad days. Um, some kind of remote control capability um, to be able to change into those different programs and um, Roger or FM system um, type thing to overcome distance and, um, and background noise, uh, which can be difficult for um, patients who have many years disease because they lose the ability to um, distinguish um, uh, speech in background noise specifically. And then for our retrocochlear pathologies, um, these would be our um, acoustic neuroma patients who, um, depending on the severity of the hearing loss, um, may benefit from hearing aids, sometimes um, across or by cross if, um, if the one ear is um, severe or profound. Um, a bone anchored hearing aid, which can be used as a cross for those who are interested in that. And then if um, speech discrimination is quite poor and um, outcomes are unlikely to improve, then a cochlear implant um, or a bimodal system might be indicated. And that brings me to the end of my presentation. Thank you, Dr. Bettina. It's a pleasure to have you as our guest speaker tonight. 
I would like to share in the Philippine setting, an ENT doctor who specializes in balance disorders, works with an audiologist and can provide balance testing and patient care. The diagnostic test such as VNG allows ENT doctors and audiologists to record and interpret eye movements and look for patterns indicating an inner ear dysfunction as the cause of vertigo. Patients are then offered vestibular rehabilitation therapy. Now, if the patient also has hearing loss, additional tests of the inner ear may be suggested by the ENT doctor with the support of their recommended hearing care centers. Most of the time, the audiometric test will be conducted on an outpatient basis for patients with hearing loss in the presence of vertigo. So Manila Hearing Aid offers audiometric tests that can help determine the type, degree, configuration of hearing loss, and the clinic's hearing care specialists are well-trained and fully equipped to guide patients on specific hearing tests that they have to go through. Also, as part of Manila Hearing Aid brand promise to offer a wide range of hearing care solutions, Manila Hearing Aid partners with various hospitals in the country by providing gold standard balance testing machines and equipment from world-renowned brands designed to diagnose patients with vertigo or balance conditions. We all know vertigo can be a disabling, can be disabling and can last for hours to days. It can render patients unable to work for weeks. But the good news is there's always a way to manage this condition with the right partner in hearing healthcare. Okay, so we will now proceed to our question and answer session with our guest speakers. For the question and answer, a question will flash on our screen and I will read it for both of you and hear your answers about it. For a quick guide, all questions will be divided. So there will be questions for Dr. Lianes and there will be questions for Dr. Bettina. Now we'll sort them based on the context of the question. Okay, so let's start. Okay, so the first question goes, it came from an anonymous, an anonymous person. So lots of folks getting vertigo in the pandemic who are not usually prone to it, like me. I never had it before, but suddenly had two episodes early in the pandemic. Thankfully, it never returned. So are there any explanation? Um, doctor, I think this question is addressed to you, Dr. Aries. Okay, so thank you for the question. Of course, the perception of uh, having a lot of uh, vertigo, vertigo episodes during the pandemic might not be as accurate as, as we desire, no? because we need probably to have some uh, prevalence studies to do that. It might be that it's uh, occurring. For example, BPPV is the most common cause of vertigo, probably because we are not moving around. And uh, this might induce some movement of the particles and induce a BPPV. Some would probably surmise that it's related to COVID-19. COVID-19 is a viral uh, infection affecting the nasal mucosa and probably sipping into the eustachian tube in the middle ear and causing some form of dizziness. And of course, the, the thing here is vertigo is a symptom. We have to look for the cause to be able to, to determine uh, what caused the vertiginous episode. It's spontaneously recovered. So I might be thinking that uh, it's probably due to some form of uh, some form of uh, BPPV because it's the most prevalent cause of uh, vertigo and without any associated uh, symptoms. Uh, other than that, it might be some form of middle ear effusion uh, affecting the uh, so, uh, uh, the lateral canal probably. But uh, I, I can really say, I can't really uh, be definite about it until we do a, a complete history and a physical examination. Thank you. Dr. Aries, just a follow-up question. Do you think anxiety could have triggered also this vertigo? Or do you often see yeah. anxious patients to have vertigo? Yes, uh, of course, there are a lot of, uh, if you, you talk to the psychiatrist, there are a lot of consults for uh, depression, anxiety during the pandemic because of some, of course, there are, many are afraid no? because we don't, it's an unknown disease and it's very fatal. So everybody was jittery about the condition without having the vaccines early on in the start of the pandemic. It might be due to that probably as part of the uh, anxiety or it may be a uh, contributory to the occurrence of uh, dizziness. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Aries. So for the second question, it's from Diana. This actually came from our social media. So the second question goes, okay, 
Is it true that hearing aids can help people with vertigo and balance problems? My dad has vertigo and is currently diagnosed with severe hearing loss. We are planning to ask for a hearing aid quotation and wondering if it can also help him with his vertigo. Is it hitting two birds in one stone kind of management? Uh, Dr. Bikini, what's your comment regarding mm. this? My um, comment here would be um, certainly if um, certainly for the for the hearing loss, um, the hearing aids would be appropriate. Um, we have vertigo and balance problems. So in in my vocabulary, vertigo is a rotational type of um, experience. And here I would certainly um, recommend a, a referral to uh, to an ENT doctor to investigate that. Um, it is not commonly treated with hearing aids. Like I said earlier, um, sort of general balance problems, um, if, if it's just kind of an unsteadiness and a, and a, a propensity to, to, for, for falls or a risk for falls where people aren't, aren't quite steady, um, that has been shown that the hearing aids may be able to um, to help stabilise, but it certainly um, wouldn't be a therapy as such. So I would certainly be um, recommending first of all the investig investigation of the of the um, the vertigo and whether that can be treated. Um, with therapy, um, vestibular rehabilitation therapy can be um, very effective for um, for these sorts of things. And if it's again, if, if it's a short type of vertigo, it could just be a cantilever repositioning uh, maneuver, which could be a very uh, quick um, and and very effective treatment for that. Um, but the hearing aids, not so much. Okay. Thank you, Doctor. Okay, so for the third question, it came from Maria Luisa Sipcon. This also came from our social media. She said, um, I'm having a hard time hearing and understanding what other people are saying. And at the same time, I feel like there is something scratching inside my ear, especially when I am tired. What should I do? Okay, Doc, Dr. Aries, what, what is your recommendation? Of, uh, I think uh, the patient is, uh, of course, having hearing loss uh, and with uh, problems with speech discrimination. So we have to be wary. Uh, we have to check the hearing status of this patient. If it's one-sided, if it's asymmetric hearing loss, we might want to consider an acoustic neuroma, as Dr. Turnbull has uh, shown in her lecture, uh, because it's a more urgent uh, condition that we need to see because it's amenable for surgery for smaller cases or watchful waiting uh, for uh, uh, for these cases. But it's important to refer them to the audiologist to assess the hearing status. Uh, it, it's also important for the ENTs to examine the ear and do some uh, tests. If the nature of the hearing loss is sudden, then we have to consider sudden sensory neural hearing loss and do immediate uh, intervention like uh, giving steroids or an intratympanic steroid injection. So uh, we have to qualify the based uh, specific factors uh, uh, of what the, the patient uh, has presented and so that we'll be able to clinch the diagnosis and do an appropriate management. But of course, we have to work with the audiologist to assess the hearing status of this patient if the patient would warrant hearing amplification later on if we have ruled out an acoustic neuroma. Okay, thank, thank you. you, Doc. Thank you, Doc Aries. Okay, so for the fourth question goes. Um, let me post the fourth question on the screen. Okay. So the fourth question um, came from anonymous. So, okay. So the fourth question: Can hearing aids cause vertigo? Sorry, yep. Bettina. <laughs> regard. <laughs> This is a very interesting question. Um, generally, no. However, um, there I have seen some cases where um, uh, the 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 hearing aid coupling, so the the mold, um, can interfere um, with the nerve that runs through the 
ear canal and that um, can in some patients um, cause a sense of imbalance. Um, this is quite rare though, um, but it can be fixed by changing the uh, length of the mould or, or moving to a, a more dome type of situation. Uh, there is also a phenomenon called the Tulio phenomenon where um, a loud sound can cause a, um, a, a balance, uh, imbalance or a feeling of um, balance disorder and um, I, I guess having a hearing aid with the amplification of those loud sounds um, could potentially trigger such a Tulio phenomenon. Again, this is quite rare. Um, but on, in general, I would say that hearing aids themselves do not cause um, a vertigo. Thank you, Dr. Ara. So the fifth question from Philip, a question we received through our inquiry form. Um, can migraine trigger vertigo? Dr. Aris, can migraine trigger vertigo or is it part of vestibular migraine? Or can, can yes. We yeah, so as I've mentioned a while ago, there's an entity that's been recognized, a vestibular migraine, with the criteria of having headaches. Now, there are uh, specific uh, definitions for this, but basically you have headaches and uh, at least 50% would be moderate to severe uh, vert vertigo associated with phonophobia and sensitivity to light and to motion. Uh, it's an entity that we need to recognize also, not only just isolated migraine, but together with the uh, vertiginous episodes. And basically, this, the, the treatment is uh, uh, given would be the same as uh, vestibular migraine, but uh, you have to monitor these patients also and uh, rule out other possible causes. Thank you. Okay. Doc, Eric, uh, Doc, Doc Aries, there's a follow-up question. Um, what's, what do you usually advise patients with, um, with having this vertigo? What kind of exercise do you uh, advice patients in your clinic uh, for vestibular migraine. Yeah, I mean, in, let's say vertigo in general. In general, of yeah. course, uh, the, the key here is we ask the patient to move around, depending on the on the again, depending on the specific diagnosis. If it's BPPV, yeah. we ask the patient, uh, of course, do a repositioning maneuver. For the elderly, who cannot undergo repositioning maneuvers because of uh, problems in the spine. Then we can probably do some exercises uh, to help them, like Brant Darab's exercises or uh, coxicothern exercises. Of course, it's the purview of the um, rehab medicine specialists and the physiotherapists or the physical therapists. Uh, so we work together uh, to, so for them to provide um, um, customized uh, uh, vestibular exercise program. But basically, that's what Dr. Turnbull has said, to prevent falls in the elderly and improve uh, or decrease the episodes of vertigo and improve vestibular compensation. Okay, thank you. So for the sixth question from, again, from Anonymous, if I cannot avail hearing aids for my papa yet, is there any other way to manage his hearing loss and vertigo? What can an audiologist recommend that we can do at home? Mm. Okay, so for this question, may I ask both um, Dr. Bettina and Dr. Lianis. Mm. So, uh, it's, it's a very good question, actually. Certainly um, for hearing loss, um, hearing aids are not always the, um, the only option. So there are other um, assistive listening devices, for example. So there are um, TV listeners, very inexpensive headphones that can help. Um, and then just the basics, um, some hearing tactics and strategies. Um, there's um, a lot of counseling that we do around um, just reducing background noise, for example, um, facing um, the speak or facing the person, um, having good lighting, um, speaking clearly, uh, not shouting. So there are uh, quite a number of um, very well documented strategies that um, that can certainly help with the hearing loss. 
with the vertigo, um, again, it comes down to understanding what is causing that vertigo um, because um, there are some very specific different causal factors and we would treat these very differently. So I think we have um, discussed this quite a lot and Dr. Lianis has um, a, a talked quite extensively about this. Um, again, it's the um, the exercises around the um, canalith repositioning, if it's uh, more of a BPPV um, type of situation with a migraine, it would be managing migraine um, probably with some medication and potentially even um, dietary. Um, as with uh, many years disease, um, we would again be looking at dietary and um, pharmacological treatment there. Okay, thank you, Dr. Bettina. Um, Dr. Aries? Uh -huh. So I think uh, I, I don't have anything to add more to what Dr. Turnbull has said, but probably just to consider these are, elder, uh, these are elderly patients. Probably they might have age-related hearing loss separate from the vertigo, or they might have Meniere's disease. So we can manage the symptoms as what has been said by Dr. Turnbull. We manage them differently. Uh, if this is due to BPPV, then we do the uh, exercises. Um, for Meniere's disease, of course, sometimes they go to the third stage or the burnout stage where they have severe hearing loss where hearing aids are amenable. Then uh, implantable devices like uh, cochlear implantation can be also helpful in these patients. So uh, complete assessment in terms of their hearing status by the audiologists and then working with the ENT surgeon more or less to provide them better hearing amplification. Thank you. Okay, so for the next question, um, we'll, we'll, uh, there's a question in our, in our live uh, Facebook. Uh, so I'll just read, I will go through with the question. I think this is the last question for tonight. So it came from Carol Studio. So the question uh, goes, um, for asymmetric hearing loss, what is the best hearing aid? Or probably let's re rephrase it. Like, for example, a uh, uh, unilateral sudden sensory neural hearing loss. Mm -hmm. So profound hearing loss. So what is the best hearing aid for that? Mm -hmm. So, um, I mean, it comes down to the um, severity of the hearing loss. Um, so, um, sudden hearing loss um, can recover. I've had one myself. I had intratympanic um, steroids and it worked beautifully for me. Um, in some cases, um, a, a moderate or severe hearing loss can can um, stay. And um, in that case, um, a unilateral fitting um, if the hearing loss um, is more severe and um, speech discrimination is poor, then maybe a more of a cross-fitting. So this would be where you have um, a, a, a hearing aid with no gain on one side and a, um, a transmitter on the other side, a microphone that picks up the sound and transmits it over to the other side. Um, a bicross is where you have a hearing loss in one side and a dead side. So again, it's a similar as a cross, but uh, with the amplification on top of that, these systems can be very effective. Um, and if the um, patient is willing and um, a candidate for cochlear implant surgery in the case where Again, the, the hearing loss is severe or profound and and the the, uh, the criteria for cochlear implantation are changing all the time and now we're not really just looking at thresholds as we used to in the earlier days. We're really also looking at speech discrimination. So if your speech discrimination is worse than um, 60 or 70 percent, then we can start looking at cochlear implantation. And there are even hybrids where you um, can also um, re uh, preserve low frequency hearing, for example, if most of the hearing loss is in the higher frequency. So there are quite a lot of different options and it really um, again, comes down to um, audiological evaluation together with ENT evaluation of um, cochlear implantation candidacy and um, working together in the team to work out um, the best result um, and the best option for the particular patient. Because some people are very open to uh, 
and, and maybe good candidates for surgery. Others um, prefer not to do that, but there are options um, for really any case these days. Okay, so okay, so our question and answer session ends here. I know there are more questions that our guest speakers haven't answered yet, but don't worry, our team will feature it on the following days. To our guest speakers, thank you once again for being with us tonight and for sharing your knowledge and experience to all our followers. We know how important this live event has become to them as they learn a lot from both, the both of you. Thank you and until our next episode of Year to Aid. Good night, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Bettina. Thank you, Dr. Eras Milanes. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.